yeah. Then by that we'll move to the next talk, and now we'll move to England, and the next talk will be given by David J. Owens from the University of Loughborough. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, David, please. Uh, it's oh, yeah. the board. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, it's my pleasure to be talking to you today. Um, I'm going to be running through basically my recent research, uh, which formed the final part of my master's degree from Loughborough University here in the UK. Uh, next slide, please. The work focused on supersonic underexpanded jet flow past aftex, as, it, as you saw. But uh, it's relevant to high speed vehicles in the context of sort of airframe propulsion integration. In defense, uh, low observability and speed are essential um, commercially. Um, it's about short trips, lower noise, and improved emissions. Uh, the single stays single, still largely experimental, but we see AFTEC applications uh, in some concepts here as well. CFD and design tools uh, to simulate these airframe propulsion integrations are continually developing, but it's key to new designs um, with some hypersonic weapons, uh, their proposals using fuselage surfaces as full or partial intake combustor uh, and nozzle walls, giving synergistic uh, performance benefits. Slide, please. Here we can see rectangular exhausts uh, on the F-22, the B-2, and the B-21 stealth aircraft, um, which improve their infrared signature quite significantly. Uh, using the vehicle rear as an expansion ramp allows high effective exhaust velocities and low engine external drag. The Aerion AS-2 there in the bottom right, um, it has underwing engines. Uh, similarly have, they similarly have exhaust flow past this wing surface. So clearly there's a need to stand these flows and be able to model them effectively, effectively for designers to use. Slide, please. Uh, if you just click through to bring all of those on, onto the screen, that's fine. Uh, the aim of the project was to generate a method for accurately uh, modeling 2D supersonic jet flows uh, past AFTEX. Done in several steps, establishing a method, validating it, examining the flow physics and deriving empirical predictions. So I'll be presenting sort of the results um, that I came up with, but with a, more of a focus on the application and validation of, of SUT for this case. There was significant um, uh, sort of trial and error of other solvers and other measures and things at an AIAA uh, workshop a couple of years ago, um, but SUT was not trialed there. So this is sort of how to do that. Uh, slide, please. So there's a broad depth of experimental research into these flow cases, um, with less numerically. The structures found uh, developing from a supersonic nozzle flow past this sort of aft deck, as you can see here. Um, they form a potential core with these expansion and compression regions uh, and the shear layer boundary around that. And then outside, they have a turbulent mixing region. Slide, please. The geometry used in this work was from McGurk and Beruzzi, also uh, at Loughborough here, uh, who presented Schlieren visualization that you just saw, surface pressure and pressure profiles uh, for supersonic flow uh, from a rectangular nozzle over an aft deck. Uh, and they did that for nozzle pressure ratios from 1.9 to 6. You're finding that the majority of that centerline core uh, region was 2D um, in the uh, sort of in the major axis. Uh, was attractive to me. Uh, so this is this data is used for CFD validation uh, of SC2 here. Um, so here you can see how the 3D geometry is, of the experiment has been converted to uh, what, we're, what I used in uh, 2D here. Slide, please. So I looked at the, the flow outside the nozzle uh, sort of predominantly using standard air, which uh, is not Representative, representative of the exact chemistry in real exhaust flows, um, but it allows the investigation of these basic flow physics and the structures we're trying to see. k epsilon turbulence in the literature was most popular, um, but SU2, I'm going to say it was a bit limited in this regard, um, but with what I had available, the, the sort of the various Spallot-Maris and SST models, uh, variation in the solution was very little, um, suggesting it's okay. 
JST discretization was uh, selected for its compromise of robustness and its accuracy. Now, the steady assumption that I used is largely valid, um, but the experimental results did show vertical flapping nature of the plume um, when excited by screech, but this was only at you know, uh, specific nozzle pressure ratios, not across the board. Uh, and finally, a simulation of the internal nozzle you can see here was run to develop an accurate boundary layer, uh, which could then be fed into sort of the, uh, the external um, nozzle past the AFDEC case. Unfortunately, uh, the specification of velocity profile when using the supersonic inlet boundary marker in SU2 was not supported at the time. Uh, thus, some error was expected in the location of uh, possible structures, but not in their development. So we proceeded with the research in that, in that regard. Uh, slide, please. So the geometry and the trimesh were generated with GMesh. Um, I think I could have benefited from some of the techniques pointed out in pointwise earlier. But um, we were using a bespoke set, well, made a bespoke, bespoke set of uh, automated MATLAB and Python scripts to control this. And a far field study was performed to elim eliminate non zero gradients at the boundary. GMesh is limited in its ability to specify cell sizing or doing much. Um, so this was uh, this is all automated, also implementing decay rate specification later in sort of a sourcing method uh, for those of you who might have come across that before. Uh, if you just click, please. Uh, there was significant interaction between the mesh cell sizing, um, nozzle pressure ratio and the CFL number. Using a given mesh at a lower nozzle pressure ratio, the solution converged to sort of this steady uh, solution using a CFL of about 50. We can see as we increase that uh, nozzle pressure ratio to um, sort of five and six, I think it is, um, using the same CFL number, we see this, um, this sort of unsteadiness, I want to call it, um, with some flapping motion in the residuals. Uh, the onset of this was delayed by increasing that CFL number, which is interesting. We didn't exactly get to the bottom of what was happening there, but again, I think it's related to that flapping motion we see in the plume um, of the uh, of the of the, so, so the plume um, across the deck. So click please, uh, slide please. Yeah. Okay, so looking at a baseline nozzle pressure ratio of four at a default de de deck length, the flow um, features can be examined in this X pressure, pressure gradient visualization. There are three main features to point out. Uh, the shock cell structures of expansion and compressions reflected from the deck and the shear layer. Uh, initial expansion waves emit from the nozzle and waves follow one of three categories. They either strike the deck as expansive and reflect then as expansive again. They strike the shear layer as expansive and reflect as compressive, or they reflect off the shear layer as compressive and they reflect off the deck as comp compressors after that. And you can see here, and the stronger shocks, uh, they sort of co uh, sorry, stronger shocks are sort of found where these compressive waves are coalescing. Secondly, there is the separation bubble towards the deck termination, which is highly coupled to the surrounding shocks, as you can imagine, and it also reattaches to the deck uh, depending on that deck length. And finally, we see jet deflection at the end of the deck uh, is caused by local interactions of the deck termination shock and the shock cell structures. Slide, please. Comparing it to the experimental Schlieren, um, SU2 captured the asymmetric potential core and the difference in turbulent intensity between the upper shear layer and the deck boundary layer. Uh, the separation is shown in the dark region near the, the deck, um, and the lower shear layer uh, grew faster than the upper shear layer despite starting um, at the deck termination, as you can see there. The shock cells and the separation interacted strongly, creating a pressure field which exerted uh, a force on the deck and deflected this plume, whose magnitude, as you can see here again, was predicted well. There is a discrepancy in the, the sort of the core length, as you can see, um, SU2 predicted much faster um, MAC decay basically um, than what was actually experienced. Uh, and then down. Sorry, yes, the, the deck surface pressure was closely matched up to one hydraulic diameter, um, as you can see on the right here of the CFD. Um, but later down past one hydraulic diameter, the CFD showed greater compression downstream. And then at the bottom here, you can just see 
Um, this was basically demonstrating what those characteristic waves are looking like and the interactions that occur in there. You can see close to the nozzle, there's these interactions of the uh, waves uh, emitting towards the shear layer and towards the deck. And then later on, you can see them reflecting off the shear layer coming close to where that separation is actually being induced. Slide, please. For the nozzle pressure ratio of four, um, two shocks on the deck were observed close to the termination, um, also interacting with the termination shock. Um, as we increase the length of the deck, um, th that is by uh, increasing the deck length to nozzle height ratio, um, these two shocks um, remained and they were where earlier reflected compression waves from the shear layer coalesced and induced separation. Termination shocks uh, and their interactions were with the shock cells to take, dictate which way the plume deflects, with compression waves uh, tending to cause a downward deflection. And if you just click, please. Uh, the axial growth of expansions and compressions with nozzle pressure ratio was reflected in the CFD, um, despite generally predicting shorter core length, as I said. Um, the more diffused shear layers were notably captured well for the nozzle pressure ratio of three compared to four, um, and the change in the plume deflection is well represented. What you can basically see there is as we increase that nozzle press ratio, that plume is sort of deflecting downwards and then upwards. Um, so we'll just take a, a look at that again. So slide, please. Um, the plume deflection angle was, let's just wait for the latency. Slide, please. Uh, there we go. It's up. Okay, so the plume deflection angle was measured using the momentum flux at the deck end, um, integrated from the deck to the nozzle height. Um, for a sweep of nozzle pressure ratios and deck lengths, the deck deflection angle showed this sort of sinusoidal type relation, um, whose amplitude grew with nozzle pressure ratio, uh, as you can see. The relation between the nozzle pressure ratio and the deflection was represented empirically, um, and coefficients were computed using MATLAB's nonlinear fit tool for each deck length, that is. Um, and these coefficients actually vary linearly with the nozzle pressure ratio, allowing basically an angle prediction of the plume for a specific nozzle press ratio and a given deck length. So we, yeah, so we've just got the example up here. Um, testing was carried on 20 different values that weren't used to build the relation. Um, here's the one shown here. The maximum error in this, across these values was 3% in the sort of uh, when we use the relation, the prediction, sorry, compared to just computing it from the uh, from integrating nozzle height uh, up to nozzle height. Uh, and the percentage error was smaller for the larger um, nozzle pressure ratios. Slide, please. Separation in this case relied on the nozzle pressure ratio being high enough to induce uh, strong shocks and the deck being long enough to develop a boundary layer sufficiently. The changing shock structure led to differing, differing mechanisms of separation uh, and a relationship was proposed for separation location on the standard deck length. And this was non-dimensionalized by the shock cell length. The lower nozzle pressure ratio of 2.8, as you can see here, uh, no separation occurred. And we saw that in that little GIF earlier as well. Between 2.8 and 4.5, the separation saw this sort of linear relationship, um, the location did. And then above 4.5, separation was much earlier as the plume, plume lifts off the deck completely. Uh, and we saw that as well in that gift just at the end when it got to a sort of nozzle pressure ratio of um, four, five, and six. Slide, please. So, uh, at the start of this project, yeah, my main three questions were how well can SU2 model this complex flow case? Uh, what are the key flow mechanisms that work? And can we derive empirical relations across a range of nozzle pressure ratios and deck lengths? So, I've reviewed the experimental literature and numerical methods used in similar cases, seeing limited agreement in parameters such as turbulence modeling. However, many studies did use 3D simulations, and this project was limited by its 2D and steady scope. That was mainly by uh, computational resources that I had available. Validation case suggested screech was the key factor in exciting unsteady turbulent features. 3D, sorry, 3D would uh, also help the prediction of the core length with accurate modeling of the streamwise vortices shed from the nozzle corners, producing a saddle-shaped profile and axis switching. 
Secondly, yep, I used uh, MATLAB and Python to automate control of GMS, SU2, and Paraview, um, basically at will all throughout this case. And then um, the ideal parameters for SU2 in this flow case were identified, uh, finding strong sensitivity to that CFR number, as we saw earlier. Greater mesh refinement or application of wall functions is encouraged for future any future study, any future work on this. Uh, which would improve the Y plus ranges um, and increase the solution robustness. This is especially important for examining the small scale interactions between the boundary layer and the shops. Next, validation of SU2 was performed, also recognizing the limitations present, such as emission of the um, boundary layer at nozzle exit and accelerated MAC decay. Using bleed flow uh, was not trialed due to time and computational resources as well. But this may prove interesting for reducing separation and controlling the deflection angle. That would be important um, practically for sort of thrust vectoring and um, sort of controlling how these flows are actually um, contributing to the external drag of vehicles. So two significant relations were developed providing tangible tools for a designer to use at the preliminary stage. Knowing a nozzle pressure ratio and tank length, the plume deflection uh, and separation can be predictors with those two relations, enabling the aerodynamicist to add refinement in the needed locations. It would be interesting to test whether these predictions do hold true in a 3D setting with the additional streamwise losses, a saddle shaped profile, which we see in 3D, axis switching, and unsteady nature. Finally, as I've said throughout, there's a couple of capabilities that might benefit the further research in this area. That would include broader turbulence modeling, or uh, as I said, that velocity profile specification um, across a range of different markers. Uh, so next slide, please. And uh, thank you for your time. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to oblige. Thank you very much. It was very interesting and beautiful presentation. I must say that I wanted to comment about uh, wishing to see some uh, three-dimensional and time-dependent result, and I've seen that you have thought about it ahead, and in your conclusion, you indicated this uh, yes. direction further research. I think it's important. I'm pretty used to see larger dissimulation results for, uh, for jets, uh, plums, and you might need uh, something more than runs to resolve that properly. But that was very impressive and interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.